Welcome to a men's course on medieval church history. My name is Alan Vanderpaul, and I hope to present the eight lessons of this course to you. Mints received permission from Covenant Seminary to give this material, editing their work, and putting it in Mints format. And we've done that. So the course that you're going to hear essentially was first given by Dr. David Calhoun, but now you're hearing it from a Mints format. This first lesson concerns the Middle Ages in general, and then medieval missions. But before we begin, I'd like to point to the different time frames that often we give the history of the church. First, the first 500 years we often call ancient church history. Sometimes historians like to go to the year 600, but as you can see, we're using 500 year chunks of time to make it easier to remember. After the ancient church history, we have a 1,000 year period of the medieval church, the year 500 to 1500. And then 1500 to the present, we can call the modern church. Now the medieval church really has two sections, each 500 years long. This course is going to deal a little with the first half of the Middle Ages, and then it will give more time spent on the second half of the medieval period. And you'll see here, the last hundred years of this period, I have marked specially 900 to 1,000 dark ages. I do that because the author of the course is going to speak that way in a moment. Now let's talk about the early Middle Ages, which is the same as saying medieval period. The expression Middle Ages became common in the time of the Renaissance. That would be the last 200 years here and just beginning into the modern period. There they spoke of that thousand year period before their time as the Middle Ages. People living during the Middle Ages did not know they lived in that time. Now sometimes people call this whole thousand year period the Dark Ages. And Calhoun disagrees with that. He says there was light in many parts of culture, in Europe and other places, that we would not call it the Dark Ages. But he does admit that the years 900 to 1000 maybe could be called Dark Ages because um, there was little learning going on, uh, little development in many ways going on. And so uh, we will call that the Dark Ages when we get to that part. First, we're going to speak about the first 500 years of the Middle Ages, which we will sometimes call the second 500 years of church history. The map of Europe was quite different as the Middle Ages began. In the beginning of church history, the Roman Empire seemed to dominate the European continent. But the Roman Empire disintegrated, and in its place, barbarian tribes came. The Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Franks, the Saxons, and others. As we know, Rome fell. It took time. The fall happened gradually, and these people not only overcame Rome, but they started to dominate Europe. They were nomads, going from place to place across Europe. It's not that there were national boundaries, but each seemed to have his place, each tribe did, on the European continent. And all of this movement took place because of a tribe in Asia, the Huns, a warlike people who pressed westward into Europe. And as they came, the tribes of northern Europe started to move as well. 
Europe became a place of mass migrations from place to place. The most famous of the leaders of the Huns was Attila the Hun. He was somebody who got things done with a strong hand. Now, as Europe was divided according to where different tribes ruled, the big picture looked like that. There was a smaller picture going on in Europe, described as feudalism. Because within the realms that these nomadic tribes governed, smaller estates were formed with rulers and vassals and the vassals were accountable to their leaders. They had to answer to them and sometimes fight for them. The most important figures in the system of feudalism consisted of farmers and soldiers uh, who could serve the masters. Uh, scholars were not very important at that time. And yet, although Europe seemed divided by all these different tribal groups, there was one unifying factor in Europe, and that was Christianity. Because the Christian gospel had moved to these um, tribes, and many of them had become Christians. So although Rome fell, Christianity did not. Christianity had uh, changed the lives of many of the barbarians. As we look at the second 500 years of church history, we begin to talk about the Roman Catholic Church. Because by this time, bishops in Rome believed that they were successors of Peter. They believed that Peter gave authority, that Christ gave authority to Peter to plant the church. They believed the keys of the kingdom were given to Peter and that the Pope represented Peter and spoke for Peter and for Christ, both in what the Pope said and what he did. Pope Leo was a great Pope of the fifth century. It was he who made the connection between the office of the Pope and the authority of Peter. In Leo, we see a strong statement of official Roman Catholicism. He concentrated church power and glorified it. Gregory the Great was another pope in the 6th century. As Leo elevated the power of the Roman Catholic Church, Gregory extended the limits of the Roman Catholic Church as the great missionary pope. Rome was a great center of Christianity during the second 500 period of the church. And other great centers of Christianity included Constantinople, sometimes called the Second Rome. Eventually, the Roman Empire divided into East and West. And although both parts were ruled by Constantinople, there were other centers of Christianity. But at that time, no other cities could compete with Rome in the West and Constantinople in the East. The Patriarch in Constantinople was the counterpart of the Pope in Rome. One of the great emperors was Justinian. He was great because he started to reconquer the areas that had been lost to the barbarians. Justinian was ruler in Constantinople, and he did much for the church. He built the Church of Holy Wisdom called the Santa Sophia. At the time, it was the greatest church, perhaps, in the world. The building was massive and glorious with soaring ceilings, high circular ceilings, and one of those who walked in, Justinian said, O Solomon, I have outdone you, the first time he walked into the church. 
As we think about the second 500 year period, it is appropriate to mention two men who greatly affected the Christian church. Charlemagne, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in Europe, and Muhammad, the founder of Islam. On Christmas Day, A.D. 800, Charlemagne was crowned Pope, uh, crowned by the Pope of the Holy Roman Empire. This was the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire, which lasted almost 800, almost a thousand years. Someone has said the only problem was the name, Holy Roman Empire. It was not holy, it was not Roman, it was not an empire. It was not holy because it was brutal and did awful things in the name of the Holy Roman Empire, even in the name of Christianity. It was not Roman because Charlemagne was German and his center of power was Germany. It was not an empire really either because it was not as large as most empires are. Yet Charlemagne's court was the center of power and also of much learning and evangelism. It was there that Christianity not only survived, but spread to surrounding kingdoms. While the northern part of the Western world was struggling over the fall of the Roman Empire, trying to organize and preserve itself, a new anti-Christian movement arose in the south, Islam. It was the strongest, most determined enemy that Christianity would have for the next 500 years, and the 500 years after that, and maybe the 500 years after that. Muhammad died in 632. In the 100 years after his death, Islam, the religion he spread or called, spread with great force and speed across North Africa, wiping out Christian centers. He went as far as Turkey, tried to conquer Constantinople, and in the West tried to invade Europe via Spain. Islam was finally defeated in Europe. It did not defeat Europe. It was defeated in the Battle of Tours, France in 731. Muslims were also stopped in 718 as they tried to conquer Constantinople. There had been almost a hundred years of fast, vigorous movement, then this temporary stop. But eventually Constantinople fell to the Turks and then to the Muslims. So Islam moved in eventually and conquered that great city. Let's take a few moments to look at what was going on in Asia. During this rapid survey of the second 500 years of the church, we have to look at the church in Asia and Africa. Asia, which was in the Roman Empire, fell to Islam. The areas where Caesar ruled was now under the dominion of Islamic armies and rulers. In those lands around the Mediterranean, the lands of the old Roman Empire, there was a strong church in Persia, the Nestorian church. It was a church that was greatly persecuted. It produced many martyrs. And when Muslims entered Persia, the modern countries of Iraq and Iran, Islam became the dominant power in the area. But Christianity was not completely wiped out. In the second hundred years of the church, Christianity not only survived in Persia, it also spread vigorously 
the gospel all the way to China. In 635, Persian missionaries reached the capital of the Tang Dynasty in China, once considered the end of the world. We need to be aware that Christianity and churches were in China and great churches were built there before the days of the modern missionary movement. The other significant place in Asia consists of India. The church there was founded maybe by Thomas. It also received an Alexandrian scholar and missionary, Pantanus. The Mar Thoma Church in India, which is still there today, was able to survive in the second 500 years of the church as a tiny community in a vast non-Christian sea. In Africa, Christianity in the church did not fare well in many places because of Islam. Today, there are very few churches or Christians in North Africa. There may not be any place in the world more fiercely anti-Christian than Islamic countries in North Africa. The only exception was Egypt. Egypt had a strong Christian church. Even though Islam dominated Egypt, it did not completely obliterate the Coptic church. In Nubia, just south of Egypt, which is modern-day Sudan, Christianity not only survived, it grew vigorously. And then in Ethiopia, further south still, we find the most vital expression of African Christianity in that time of history. This is a brief summary of the church in the first 500 years of the Middle Ages. Now let's look at medieval missions. Most of the missionaries in that earlier part of the Middle Ages remain unnamed and unknown. In the later period of the Middle Ages, we know some of the names. For example, we know of Ophelus, an instrument in converting the Goths, one of the barbarian tribes in Northern Europe. Ophelus was his Greek name. It means little wolf. Yet his ancestry was Greek. His grandparent lived in Cappadocia the land of many church fathers. They were captured by the Goths in a raid and brought to Europe. And yet those grandparents were Christians and their grandson Ophelus was Christian as well. He was called by the Goths appointed bishop of the Goths north of the Danube River. One of the great things he did was to translate the Bible in their language. It's the oldest literary work we have in a Germanic language. And because he translated all the books of the Bible into Gothic, except 1 Kings and 2 Kings, we indeed have a treasure. He said the Goths did not need first kings and second kings, because they knew how to fight already. While Ophelus was a great missionary, unfortunately he was Arian. The teaching, you may remember, which says Jesus, or the Son of God, was God's first creature, not fully divine. Ophelus taught there's only one God, and that God has one Son, who's the maker of everything else, and there's no one like him. Arianism spread with the gods throughout the Germanic tribes and down into the Roman world. The result was that 
200 years after the Council of Nicaea, the old Roman Empire was theologically divided more than in the past, partially Arian, partially Orthodox. Then there were the Franks, converted directly to Orthodox Christianity. The story of the conversion of the Franks, which took place around the year 500, has to do with a queen named Clotilda. She was an Orthodox Christian, married to the king of the Franks, whose name was Clovis. And she began right away to convert him to Christianity. He became a Christian. And when he did, all the Franks did too. In those days, a king made the choice for all his subjects. The missionary movement during the second 500 years of Christianity had four centers. First, Rome. It sent missionaries primarily to the region north of it. Next, we think of Ireland and Scotland combined. They sent missionaries into Europe and England. So Rome was a center of missionary activity. England and Ireland were as well. Then Persia in the east became a center of Persian monk missionary travel down the old Silk Road all the way to China. They established a Nestorian church in China in the 7th century. And Constantinople became the fourth great missionary center. It sent missionaries northward into Eastern Europe, Ukraine, and Russia. Dr. Um, Calhoun says he wants to focus on providing some detail about the Persian and Nestorian missionary efforts in China. The Persian missionary Alipin reached Chang'an, the capital of China, in 635. This was then the largest city in the world at the time, one of the most prosperous and advanced cultures. It was the time of the Tang Dynasty. The first Christian church was built in Chang'an in 638, three years after the missionary arrived. And there was already a Christian church in the largest city of the world so early in the church history. Despite the persecution of Buddhists, Christianity grew. The Nestorian church almost totally disappeared, however, in the ninth century. And scholars have debated why the church disappeared so soon. Yes, there was persecution. There was also syncretism, an attempt to blend pagan thought with Christian thought and kind of have an amalgamation as one's religion. There was the foreign orientation of the church. People viewed it as coming from foreigners in the West. But Calhoun also believes that probably the most important reason to explain why the church declined is that the church was aligned with the politics of the country. It was aligned with the Tang Dynasty, which protected the church. When that dynasty declined, the church disappeared. Think about Russia. Missionaries from Constantinople pressed north among the Slavic peoples. Missionaries from eastern part of the church were restricted in their movement because Roman Catholicism stood to the west and um, it seemed their only option was then to send missionaries to the north. Two Greek brothers Cyril and Methodius, 
were sent by the emperor to preach in Morovia, modern-day Austria. These two missionaries moved to Austria, produced an alphabet, translated the Bible in Slavonic. They also translated liturgies or their worship service book into Slavonic. It was quite a different strategy from the way the Roman church did. Missionaries from Rome used Latin. They taught people to read the Latin Bible and continued their Latin Mass. Eastern missionaries, however, used Greek, and they translated the Bible and liturgy then into the language of the people. What were the reasons that we can use to explain conversions? Well, some people were forced to become Christians. There were Franks forcing Aryans into orthodoxy using their military power. Some people claim Christ because they thought it had advantages. The gospel really does meet inner needs of human beings, but people thought that relief from the gospel would be what they want, and so they claim Christ merely for themselves in some sense. Sometimes people were converted by what we now call, call power encounters. One of the really concern, real concerns people had in medieval period is which God had the power, and they wanted to be in connection with the power of an earthly lord who had strength. Boniface went to Germany, and he found it difficult for the Christian church to make much headway there until he cut down a large oak tree that had once been dedicated to the worship of the god Thor. People had believed that anyone who damaged the tree would suffer terrible things. When Boniface found that he was not making much progress, he had the idea to take the axe and cut the tree down. It was a sensational event as everyone watched, expecting him to be struck down dead immediately. Yet once he cut it down, nothing happened to him. So everyone who saw it became Christian. With all of these reasons for conversion to Christianity, there obviously were people who came to true faith. Still, there was the message that God saves sinners through Christ as we receive the gift of salvation by faith. In all of this, God's providence was at work. The Roman Empire was able to be used as a wonderful instrument of God's providence. In the early church, a vast area of relative peace and ease of travel allowed the gospel to move quickly and easily from one end of the empire to another. Even the barbarian raids, which one would not normally believe God would use as missionary instruments, were part of his providence. There was the old Silk Road. People thought that it was there so the silk could go to the west. But God used it to send the gospel to the east. God is amazing and strong and is determined to send his word to the lost. That's the end of the first lesson of medieval church history. Welcome to Lesson 2 of the Mint's Course on Medieval Church History. We're going to begin talking about the Christianization of Great Britain. During the Roman period in British history, the 1st through 4th centuries, the people of Britain were Christianized. 
When the Romans withdrew, the empire began to shrink and fall apart in the fourth century, and it left a vacuum in Britain. The Angles and Saxons began to pour in, but they were not Christian. And the Christian Britons, understandably, but sadly, did not evangelize them. Before the Anglo-Saxon tribes were converted, something else happened in the history of the islands. On the fringe of Europe, a large island stood called Ireland. It was to Ireland that the gospel went, and from Ireland that the gospel returned to England and then the continent of Europe. Ireland was a land in which people worship spirits and practice human sacrifices. Amazingly, over about a century, it was transformed from that dark and dismal place to an island of saints and scholars. In God's providence, the man used to transform Ireland was named Patrick. He grew up in a Christian home, and it is interesting to think that when Patrick was growing up in England, a Romanized African was living in North Africa, Augustine. Patrick was taken to Ireland as a slave, sold in the slave market in Ireland, and became a shepherd for his master. Eventually, he was able to escape Ireland went to the continent via a ship, and a couple of years later returned to his home in Britain. One night he had a dream or vision. An Irish man came to Patrick in it and gave him a number of letters. He took the letters in the dream and began to read them. And one of the letters said, the voice of the Irish, we beg you to come and walk with us once more. Eventually, he regarded it not as the voice of a dream, but as the voice of the Lord calling him. He preached a new message to the Irish about God's three faces. This was the phrase he used as a reference to the Trinity. It was the best way he had to refer to the Trinity. The message he presented was not about an angry Celtic god who demanded human sacrifices. Rather, he gave a message from a loving god who himself provided the sacrifice. So in Patrick's time, through this man and his followers, the gospel came to Ireland and converted many of the Irish to Christianity. One of the enduring treasures of the coming of Christianity to Ireland was the establishment of monasteries, centers for copying books, especially the Bible. As the Dark Ages began to descend on the continent, the light of learning was kept alive in Ireland by monks who sat in their small places each day and copied scripture. The Irish scribes did not merely copy the Bible, they did it beautifully, with amazing depictions and illuminations of letters. The monks evangelized Ireland and preserved learning for future generations. Scotland was next to Ireland and it was not evangelized except partly by Ninian, who came in the 5th and 6th century. He was a British missionary trained in Rome who worked among the people of southern Scotland. Columba was one of the Irish monks. He went only a few kilometers from Ireland to Scotland to a place called Iona. He settled there and built a monastery, very much like the monastery in Ireland. It was in Iona 
that Columba and his disciples began to evangelize further into Scotland. The tiny island of Iona became the source of missionaries who were going throughout the length and breadth of Scotland. Missionaries went further to the continent of Europe. Columban or Columbanus went into the heart of the European continent. He was part of the first wave of Irish, Scottish, and English monks who left their homelands to cross the channel and into go into countries to do missionary work. We know there were Irish and Ionan missionaries went, who went out there. Because of the Iona cross, it was a cross with a circle. It stands for eternity. Historians have found this Ionan cross in old buildings in Europe. Then there was Augustine of Canterbury. Some kings were converted through his preaching and others went with him. Before, this en before ending the story of missions, we want to emphasize one important point which is the English mission to the continent. There was the Irish mission, which included Patrick going to Ireland, Columba going to Iona, missionaries from Iona going to Lindisfarne, and finally Iona and Irish missionaries going to the heart of Central Europe, planting their Iona crosses and preaching the gospel. Then from Rome came St. Augustine to Canterbury. From Canterbury, the gospel was preached to the Anglo-Saxons in the heart of England. From those Anglo-Saxons who were converted, some became missionaries to the Netherlands and Germany. It is interesting how quickly these new churches became missionary churches. The most famous was Winfrith, whom we call Boniface, who went to Germany. People call him the apostle to Germany. He was the man who cut down the oak tree in order to demonstrate God's power being stronger than the power of Thor, the god of the Germans. Patrick was identified with Ireland, but he was English. Columba was the hero of Scotland, but he was Irish. Boniface was the apostle to, German, to, to Germany, but he was English. This is probably the way it should be. God sends his people into the entire world. National boundaries have little importance in this as he plants and establishes his church. The next section in this lesson concerns eternal wisdom, learning, and theology. We're going to hear the names of some of the great scholars in the Middle Ages. The first, Bothius. He wrote a book in prison called The Consolation of Philosophy. Much trouble came on him Interestingly, he tried to do without reference to God or the afterlife as he tried to explain the reasons for his suffering and imprisonment. He tried to find consolation in philosophy itself. Bothius, though, became a major channel through which Aristotle and Greek philosophers entered the Middle Ages. Another man Isidore of Seville, a city in southern Spain. He wrote a book of sentences and origins or etymologies. His book of sentences became a theological text in the Middle Ages until the 12th century. The book of sentences was his way of trying to arrange systematic theology 
He collected ideas from Augustine, the Church Fathers, and put them together in a systematic way. So the importance of Isidore is that one man we find is a theologian in almost everything. These two people, Bothius from Rome, Isidore from Seville, were important educators and scholars who tried to capture something of the knowledge of the past, write it down, and preserve it for the future. A third scholar, Dionysius the Areopagite, sometimes called Dionysius the Pseudo-Areopagite. By tradition, Dionysius is the name of the first bishop of Athens. His name appears in Acts 17 after Paul preached on Mars Hill in Athens. When the writings of Dionysius the Areopagite were found, many people thought they came from Paul's disciple, who was traditionally viewed as the first pastor of the church there. But much later, scholars applied textual criticism and discovered it could not have been written by a first century Greek. It was probably written from Syria in the 5th or 6th century. Thus, Dionysius the Areopagite became known as Dionysius the Pseudo, or the False Areopagite. Dionysius' significance can be summarized in two ways. First, he stressed the negative way to do theology. This means he stressed what we do not know. It's called the apophatic or negative theology. The mainstream theology in the Eastern Orthodox Church does this as it seeks to maintain the mystery of God. Yet the Orthodox believed that there is true knowledge, true revelation. Dionysius stressed more the side of our lack of knowledge, our ignorance, our darkness. Mystics everywhere, east and west, drew heavily from Dionysius. The influence of Dionysius is prevalent in Eastern churches. Now Dionysius wrote two books, one about celestial hierarchy and the next about ecclesiastical hierarchy. In the first book about celestial or heavenly hierarchy, he arranged angels into three orders of three each. In other words, nine orders. He used Neoplatonic theory of the chain of being, which claimed that between us and God there are countless divinities, some closer to God, some closer to us. And that became the pattern by which he described the function and place of these hierarchy of angelic beings. They had different ranks, different places on the ladder to heaven. The importance of this book, Celestial Hierarchy, is that it is linked to his other book, Ecclesiastical Hierarchy. In the Middle Ages, it was often believed that the things on earth reflected the things in heaven. And so Dionysius used his view of the angels to defend the hierarchy in the church, which included popes, cardinals, archbishops, bishops, and down the line. In the Middle Ages, there were two important theological debates, or I should say two important theological scholars in one debate on the Lord's Supper. Both were part of the same monastery of Corby. There was the scholar Radbertus and Rotramnus.
They debated over the presence of the body of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Brad Burtis held to the view we call real presence. It's the view that became Roman Catholic doctrine. In this view, the wine and bread were actually transformed into the body of Christ. Bertramnus answered by holding to what we call the spiritual presence of Christ's view. This view sounds much more like the Reformed doctrine of Zwingli and Calvin than anything else we can identify it with. The Church considered these two views. And in A.D. 1050, it decided to take a stand, endorsing the view of Radbertus. Since then, transubstantiation became a fixed dogma of Roman Catholicism and was made so in the Lateran Council a little over 160 years later. Then there was the question of predestination. By the time of the Middle Ages, pure Augustinianism was scarce. But there was a man named Gottschalk, a Benedictine monk, monk. He was a scholar who studied under Rotramnus, and he read Augustine. By actually reading Augustine, not commentaries on him, he absorbed the teaching of Augustine. He very much honored Augustine, and the church uh, had honored Augustine in the past. Gottschalk wrote sentences such as, God, prior to the creation of the world, unchangeably destined all his elect to eternal life, and all of the rejected who shall be condemned to eternal death. Then there was Florus of Lyon, France, a defender of Gottschalk. He wrote, none of the elect can, per can perish because of the hardness and impenitence of their hearts. None of the reprobate can be saved. Both Gottschalk and Florus spoke of the fact that the chosen are predestined to heaven and others to hell, though not to sin. The church could not agree with Gottschalk. It defrocked him, meaning it took him away from his church office. He was beaten, put in prison. His writings were little known and little used until the time of the Reformation when people discovered it and began to read it. We can also talk about the development of theology on the teaching of grace. When we think of grace, the church went back and forth. First, Jesus taught grace, but the Pharisees opposed it. Later on, in the time of Augustine, when he taught grace, the Pelagians opposed it. And later, when Augustine was rediscovered and people taught grace, the semi-Pelagians opposed it. Then in the time of the Reformation, where the Reformers taught grace, the uh, Rationalists opposed it. And also in the Great Awakening, when the Church taught grace, Liberalism opposed it. So grace reemerged in Church history frequently and each time a new heresy, which elevated the will and power of man, opposed it. And so the doctrine of grace has sort of gone back and forth in church history, but it has always remained true. Now finally in this lesson, we want to say a few things about Eastern Orthodoxy. What led to the great 
separation in the church. There were cultural differences. The Western church officially spoke Latin. The Eastern church spoke Greek. The Eastern church also took great pride in that they were the church of the seven councils because the great ecumenical councils took place in the East. Both parts of the church dealt with the doctrine of the Trinity. And four councils, all in the East, dealt with it. All the councils met in the East. And so there was a pride there about that fact. There were other names we should know. John Climacus in the monastery in Sinai, he wrote a book called Ladder of Divine Ascent, one of the most widely read manuals of monastic spirituality during the time. In the book, he stipulated 30 steps in a ladder, representing 30 years in the life of Christ. These steps included prayer, meditation, and other things to do, and think, and pray, as the soul slowly and with difficulty ascended the ladder. Second in the Eastern Church was John of Damascus, who lived in Syria. He wrote a treatise against Islam called the Ishmaelite Heresy. He entered a monastery of Mar Saba, and there he began to write on theology. He wrote an important book, The Orthodox Faith. Somebody has called it Orthodoxy's first, most important, and by some accounts only, systematic theology. He was as important to the East as Thomas Aquinas was to the West. John of Damascus also wrote hymns. Then there was a movement called Apophacticism, again referring to negative theology. It emphasized the mystery of God. Another emphasis in the Eastern Church was on tradition. The Western Church stressed tradition. The Eastern Church did more so. However, there has never been a check on the high estimate of the value of tradition in the Eastern Church. In the Western Church, reformers prodded the Church, the Roman Catholic Church, to slow down in creating new traditions. But that kind of resistance did not exist in the Eastern Church. And so the Eastern Church believed that the Spirit spoke when the ecumenical councils spoke. In fact, the Spirit now speaks in church tradition. There's a third emphasis in Eastern Orthodoxy called theosis. This means deification, when something becomes divine. It sums up the view of salvation in the Eastern Church. The idea is that we are changed so that we become like God. Athanasius said, God became man that man might become God. Western thinkers pull back from this way of speaking. But Calhoun says, if you read the literature of theosis carefully, the Eastern Church doesn't quite go over the line. Then there is the issue or emphasis of icons in the Eastern Church, images of Christ and the saints. The Western Church more likely had pictures of Jesus suffering on the cross 
So the crucifix was important in Western piety. In the Eastern Church, people depicted Christ as king and judge. He was not usually pictured as a suffering savior, but as the almighty Christ. And there was a century of controversy over the use of these icons. There was also conflict between the East and West churches over the primacy of the Pope. Ecumenical councils acknowledged Constantinople as the new Rome with equal privilege and equal rank with Rome. But the problem was that the Roman Pope didn't accept those statements. Roman popes believed that they descended from Peter, that they got their authority from him exclusively. Peter was the leader of the apostolic band and the first bishop or pope in Rome. And so the Roman church believed that they had the authority of Peter, not the Eastern church. Besides this conflict over which church leader had most authority, there was the question of filioque. In the Nicene Creed, it says, we believe in the Spirit who proceeds from the Father. The Western Church added a Greek word, or a Latin word, filioque, which means, and the Son. In the Western Church, it now says, we believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Eventually, the Western Church added this idea, but not the Eastern Church. The Eastern Church wanted preeminence given to the Father so that the Spirit related to the Father like the Son related to the Father. It did not want the idea that the Spirit related to the Son in a similar way. The East rejected this addition believed that nothing could be added to what the councils first wrote. There was also a doctrinal issue involved in this dispute. The Eastern view of the Trinity said the Father begets the Son, the Father breathes the Spirit. The Father is the one source of divinity. He's the one principle of the Godhead in the Trinity. And thus they would argue that there must be a particular emphasis on the role of the Father, which would safeguard the Trinity. We close by mentioning one more thing about iconoclasm. That is the iconoclast controversy. A struggle in the Eastern Church that lasted 100 years. Charlemagne in the West of the Holy Roman Empire, carried on a tirade against the use of icons. It was mainly an attack on the Eastern Church because he wanted to gain power in the East. And the Church had been the obstacle. The use of icons took on radical or extreme expressions in the Eastern Church. For example, sometimes they added flecks of paint from an icon which they put in the Lord's Supper wine. They thought that would increase the efficacy. The monasteries were places where the icons were drawn up, painted, venerated, and promoted. So in order to put down the power of the monasteries, some were motivated to put down the use of these icons. Emperors sent soldiers to destroy the icons. A second reason for the iconic dispute pertained to Islam. The Islamic Church, or the Islamic movement, very much disagreed with the idea of uh, using icons. And Muslims were very committed to destroy the practice.
after a long time of dispute, the controversy was settled in the Second Council of Nicaea, the last of seven ecumenical councils in 787. At that council, the icons were defended in the part of Eastern tradition. It was a great moment. It's still called the Feast of Orthodoxy to celebrate this. Argument for the icons is that they were of equal benefit with the written word of God. The church has revelation from the written word and revelation from the pictures. They are mutually revelatory, the gospel by word and the gospel by color. And we will see as the church continues eventually to move to the Protestant Reformation, that the Protestant Reformation brought the church back to the word of God alone. In the light of that, let us be thankful for the way the Lord has continued to guide the church so that today we do have the gospel in its fullness in scripture. That's the end of our second lesson. Welcome to Lesson 3 of the Mintz Course on Medieval Church History. In Lesson 3, the uh, author, Dr. Calhoun, takes an overview of the second half of the Middle Ages. To summarize the Middle Ages, it was between the years 500 and 1500 AD. We call it the Medieval Period or the Middle Ages. The early Middle Ages uh, were the years 500 to 1000. And the second half, the later Medieval Period, is 1000 to 1500. We're only in Lesson 3, but Dr. Calhoun already is here and he will spend the next six lessons dealing mostly with the later medieval period. Now this particular lesson is a very fast um, superficial overview and many of the things mentioned will be mentioned again in depth later on or they have been mentioned already in depth in earlier lessons. So he's going to cover, uh, from now on, the second half of the medieval period. First, he begins by talking a little about Africa and the situation of the church in its third 500 years. The church in Egypt, the Coptic church, survived despite the great disadvantages of Muslim rule. He writes, that was the fate of the ancient Egyptian church ever since the Muslim conquest. The church was not obliterated, it continued to live, but it struggled. South of Egypt, the Nubian church came up during the 500, third 500 years. Nubian Christianity not only reached a moment of greatness during this time, but it also faced collapse and decline. After 1500, we do not hear about Nubian Christianity again for some time. As long as that government was in power, the government which protected the church in Nubia, the church prospered. But when that government collapsed, the church did as well. And we've heard of a similar development like this in China that took place decades or centuries before. The Christians in Nubia were not able effectively to reach out in evangelism to their neighbors. And for one thing, they made themselves unpopular with their neighbors by engaging, engaging in slave trade. They took Africans from other countries and sold them to Egypt. This made it difficult for their neighbors to embrace their gospel. A third center of Christianity was in Ethiopia. There were ups and downs in that church's history. 
The situation in Ethiopia, however, remains a primary example of success of the gospel in Africa. Now we make a few comments about the church in Asia. In the 10th century, Christianity all but disappeared. The Tang Dynasty in China fell, and Christianity fell with it. Christianity, however, returned later in Mongol China. This was during the period of the fabled Kublai Khan in the third century, the greatest of the Mongol leaders in China. Undoubtedly, he was the most powerful man probably in the world at that time. His empire stretched from Korea to Burma and all the way to the Euphrates. Kublai Khan, who was not a Christian, treated the Christians as their friend. And Christianity prospered during his time and during the Tang time, the Tang dynasty. Then, after that dynasty, it was almost obliterated. It recovered during the time of Kong. And again, the same story repeated itself. With the death of their friend, Christianity died in that part of the world. That meant very few Christians were left in China in the year A.D. 1500. Let's take a moment to discuss Persia and the church there. It reached its prime in the 13th century. Then, however, much like the church in Nubia, its prime was followed by decline and collapse. By the end of the 14th century, Persian Christianity was in decline. A failure in intellect, doctrine, and study led to the decline of that church. There was almost the same story of too much dependence on government. Let's look for a moment at Central Asia. The victories of the religiously tolerant Genghis Khan of the 13th century opened up the way for the spread of the gospel. The empire, the empire of Genghis Khan extended from the Yellow Sea to the Black Sea, almost all of Asia. Christian missionaries began to move into those areas. However, then came the fiercely Muslim rule of Tamerlane. He was often called the scourge of God, the terror of the world. He had no love for Christians. And thus, the momentary opportunity in Central Asia to spread the gospel disappeared with the unparalleled destruction of churches. So by the end of the third period of 500 years each, Christianity had received major setbacks in Asia. But there were still Christian churches and communities in, in Central Asia. Yet they were relatively few in number and isolated from each other. But in Russia, there were great gains for the Christian church. Missionaries came from the Eastern Orthodox Church to Russia. At a low point in Eastern Orthodoxy during the 500-year period was the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks at the end of that period in the year A.D. 1453. Constantinople had been a great capital of the Roman Empire to the east, yet it fell to the onslaught of Islam. Further west, we take a look at the Roman Catholic Church. In its third 500-year period, it could properly be called the Roman Catholic Church. It was a period in the West we can characterize as Christendom, meaning there was a union between church and state and culture. They seemed to agree with each other in how they were leading the people in a somewhat God-conscious culture. Yet there was always, in many parts of the Christian church, a struggle with Islam. <clears throat> 
That struggle had been going on since the 7th century. Islam still controlled Spain and it grieved Christians that Islam controlled the Holy Land. For about a century and a half, churches in the West therefore engaged in one crusade after another. All of that did nothing to strengthen Christianity, but it did much to antagonize Muslims and Jews. In Europe during this time, there was also an issue of the investiture struggle. The question, who had the right to appoint bishops and church officials, the state or the church? The investiture controversy relates to the problem of actually who had control of the church. Of course, kings said they should do so, and popes claimed they have the authority. But besides many different struggles, the third 500-year period, 500 period of the church enjoyed many accomplishments. Great books were written. Many achievements were made. It was a great advance in theology, which culminated in the systematic theology of Thomas Aquinas. It was a period of piety, or at least when piety had focused. Monastic orders revived. New orders were created. Literature of devotion and piety came from the Benedictines and other monasteries. The popular piety of the people increased, yet it went in unfortunate directions. It was the time of the rise of universities. By the 12th century, there was the building of churches, great cathedrals, a wonderful time of great literature, and a period of reform in the church, though not the Protestant Reformation that we think of when we hear the word reform. In this third period of the church, it was also the time of the Lateran Council in A.D. 1215. There was an attempt before the Reformation to get the church back on track. The Lateran Council dealt with some doctrinal matters, such as transubstantiation, which, because of that council, became official doctrine in Roman Catholicism. This fourth Lateran Council also said that every Catholic should go to confession at least once a year. That indicates how lax many people were about the matter of confession. There was a period of great development in the religious orders. The Benedictines had a revival, and the Franciscans and Dominicans had their beginning. From the standpoint of the official church, at the end of 1500, it was also a time of heresy. There were the Cathari in South France. They had a religion that featured dualism, Gnostic-like, Manichaeism-style religious expression. There was also a movement of the Waldensians in Italy it was a reform, a reformation before the Reformation. In England, Wycliffe and the Lollards were preaching grace and translating scripture. In Bohemia, John Huss preached the gospel of grace, and he was burned at the stake because he refused to recant. In Florence, Italy, Savonarola preached grace and reformed the church and the city under his influence. All these kinds of developments took place in the later medieval period, and almost all of them will receive more attention in future lectures. Now let's look briefly at monasticism during this later medieval period. The rise of monasticism really began with St. Benedict in the 7th 
to the 10th century. We can speak of the period as the Benedictine centuries. Benedict did not envision great orders highly organized with centralized power. But in due time in the West, a more centralized approach to monasteries developed, particularly in the 10th and 11th centuries. This was not true in the East. Monasticism in the East continued as it was in the past, important but never overly centralized. Benedict had envisioned the monastic life as a group of lay people coming together to pray and work with their hands and serve God in the community. That pattern was largely continued in the East, but more often in the West, the monks became priests and therefore part of the official church structure. There were three main duties for the monks living in the monastery. First, they must engage in prayer and worship. For three or four hours each day, the monks were engaged in prayer and worship. It was usually communal prayer. They sang the psalms together. There was also time for private prayer. Secondly, there were five hours of study each day. It was referred to as spiritual reading, study that had a devotional character to it. They read the church fathers. They read scripture with the purpose of developing their love for God and find greater knowledge of him. Thirdly, there were six to seven hours of work each day, manual work. They took care of the buildings, produced farm food for the monastery, and went to the community to practice charity. In the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries, France became a great center of monastic life and reform in the Catholic Church. This came first with the establishment of the Cluniac Order, which was a reform movement based on Benedictine rule. During the 10th and 11th centuries, Cluny represented almost everything that was vital and progressive, in other words, good, in Western Christianity. But like many other monastic movements, Cluny eventually fell into a worldly spirit. It produced great and splendid churches, but it no longer maintained zeal for the monastic ideal. Thus, another order was formed, not far from Cluny, called the Cistercian Order. It was started by Cito. Its leader was another Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux. He was one of the major figures of the later Middle Ages. So let's comment briefly on the life of Bernard of Clairvaux. He was a great reformer. In his book, On Consideration, he wrote it for one of his own monks who was being promoted to high office, the office of the papacy. So Bernard wrote this book as a guide for him so he could know how to be a good pope. He wrote, Lordship is forbidden. Ministry is bidden. In other words, do not rule over people. Serve them. As a reformer, Bernard may remind us of medieval Puritans. He believed the church was too rich, too extravagant, and too interested in pomp and ceremony. He wanted to see these things changed. He once said, you must pass over in silence 
decay in the church. Better to provoke a scandal than to abandon the truth. In other words, he did not mind if standing for the truth upset people. It was best to stand for the truth and promote it. Bernard of Clairvaux was also a great teacher, a preacher. He was sometimes referred to as Dr. Malafluus, which meant the doctor whose words were like honey. Bernard was also a great mystic in the best sense of the word. We will describe mysticism in a later lesson. Bernard was also a full Augustinian. In his book on grace and free choice, he gives a wonderful description of the theology which St. Augustine of Hippo preached. We will also hear about Thomas Bradwardine of Canterbury, who also promoted Augustinianism. Two entirely new movements arose in the 13th century. The first was the Franciscans. Francis of Assisi in Italy was born in 1181 and died in 1226. In that short life, he made a great impact on the church in his day and on successive generations. He was a worldly young man who was dramatically converted and then went on to a life of dedication to God. He was a unique individual. Nobody quite like him in church history. He was not a scholar. He did not write much, except for a few prayers, and some of them became hymns. The life of Francis of Assisi was characterized by poverty and service. He wanted to be poor. He wanted to have people around him who believed, as he did, that life is not made up of what you have, but of what you can give. The Franciscans were not so much reformers as innovators. They created a new force in the church, which ministered to spiritual and physical needs. Their movement contrasted with the church, which was boasting in the great church at Cluny and the splendor and pomp of Rome. The order that Francis created was called Order of the Lesser Brothers. We usually refer to them as Franciscans, but the official name is Order of the Lesser Brothers, or OFM. And if you ever see a Roman um, clergy person with OFM after his name, it means he's from the Franciscans. Francis died in 1226. Only two years later, the church canonized him. That means it began to call him a saint. Almost immediately, his followers began to build a great basilica or church in his honor. And it is there in Assisi today. It became the richest church in Italy. The last order we describe consists of the Dominicans. Dominic was a Spanish monk living in a monastery trying to follow the rule of St. Augustine. He became interested through a couple of journeys. He was thinking about how Catholics could evangelize both to reach pagan people and to reclaim heretics. The heretics he particularly had in mind were the Albigensians of southern France, a Gnostic Manichaean cult that controlled much of southern France. The Dominicans stressed teaching and preaching. 
they wanted to study each order of the Catholic Church had its distinctives. And the distinctive of the Dominicans is that they were an order of scholars. Some of the great preachers of the medieval times were Dominicans. But as we said, they were also scholars. They realized it was important for them to enter universities, to infiltrate them, and become teachers. Dominicans became the educators of Europe and of the Catholic Church. One other thing we want to say about the Dominicans is that they became the inquisitors of the Middle Ages. They were the people on the lookout for heresy. They developed schemes, plans, and programs in order to identify and root out heresies. And so they gained the nickname Watchdogs of the Lord. That concludes the overall summary of the later Middle Ages, which we find in Lesson 3. Welcome to Lesson 4 in our study from Mint's course of Medieval Church History. Lesson 4 includes two topics, <clears throat> one a very sad one, one a delightful one. The sad one concerns the Crusades. The Crusades were a disastrous period for the church. People went forth into battle not realizing that Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. As we think about the Crusades, we should learn a little about Christianity and Islam. The flight of Muhammad began in the year 622. So we can use that year, AD 622, as the period when, as the time when Islam began. It was not too many years later, 638, when Jerusalem, the city that Christians thought of their holy city, Jerusalem was conquered by the Muslims. And then Islam spread rapidly across North Africa into Spain, trying to make inroads all the way into France. They were turned back in the Battle of Tours in 732. For centuries after that, Islam threatened the great Eastern Roman capital, Constantinople. And in the 11th century, that great city, um, destruction seemed inevitable. It was the time of the Crusades. The Crusades were really an attempt to do something with Islam. There were seven Crusades. If you count the Children's Crusade, there were eight. It all began in A.D. 1095, when Pope Urban II preached the First Crusade. He told people they must fight against the Muslims to free the city of Jerusalem from Muslim control. For 200 years, there was crusading activity we can talk about three general periods in this history of the Crusade. The first two, each being 50 years long. The third being 100 years long. In the first 50 years, the terms of, there were military accomplishments made by the Crusades. It was the only successful time of the Crusades. When Crusaders went to Jerusalem, in the first 50 years, they actually captured the city and they set up a Latin kingdom there. Then in the next 50 years, <clears throat> there was the reverse of all of this. Muslims fought the Crusaders and reconquered the city of Jerusalem. They regained all the property and all the advances that um, 
that the Crusades had first made. Then in the last 100 years, there was a downward spiral. The people of Europe tried to recover the early enthusiasm of the Crusades, but nothing was really successful. Why did the churches of the West pursue the Crusades? First, they wanted to honor Christ. They had a mistaken idea concerning how to honor Christ, but they thought that any real Christian would take up Christ's cause and fight for his honor. Second, they wanted to recover the Holy Land. It was important for Catholic Christians to make pilgrimages there. How could they if Islam kept them from going to those places to make their pilgrimage? So the Crusades were motiv par motivated partially to enable Christians to have Crusades again, and always a pilgrimage had meritorious uh, feature to it as well, which Christians wanted to regain. Another motive of the Crusades was to unite the two halves of Christianity. The idea began with Alexius, emperor in the East. He sent a letter to the Pope in Rome asking that Christians would come to help Christians in the East fight Islam. Alexius got more than he bargained for. He thought the Pope would send him a few hundred well-trained soldiers. But when people from the West arrived, they consisted of a huge, disorganized company of people, most of them with no soldier experience. Alexius did not know what to do with this poor crowd when it comes to uh, fighting. And so the relationship between the East and West did not improve, rather it deteriorated. If the Crusaders could not fight Muslims, they decided to fight Christians in the East. In 1204, creator, Crusaders attacked and sacked the city of Constantinople. It was a city of great ecclesiastical treasures. The Crusaders took them and brought them to Venice. There was also the desire for personal salvation. The popes used everything possible to motivate people. Pope Urban said at the beginning, the sins of those who set out thither if they lose their lives, shall be remitted in that hour. In other words, for those who went on the Crusades and died, all their sins would be forgiven. And mixed in all these motives mentioned so far, there was the desire for adventure, for an opportunity to do something different. The popes made no secret of the fact that European Christians were spending too much time fighting one another in the feudal period. It would be much better if they fought Islam in the Holy Lands. One of the most curious events during this time of the Crusades has been called the Children's Crusade. It took place in the year A.D. 1212. Perhaps as many as 30,000 children became involved. It is not known what motive the children had. Perhaps they wanted to convert Islam or Muslims. It may be they did not know themselves what they were trying to do. They did not even know how they were going to get to the Holy Land for their crusade. They went as far as Marseille, a French city on the southern coast. 
they found a large sea before them. They believed if Moses could dry up the Dead Sea for the children of Israel, God could do the same for them. But nothing happened. So some of them returned home. Others got on ships. Two of the seven ships were lost at sea. Other ships met Muslim ships in the Mediterranean and transferred the children to the Muslim ships. Then the children were transferred and sold as slaves to Muslims. There were several episodes of the children's crusade, but they all ended this way. What was the result of all of this? Well, the Crusades fell far short of their intended aims. Some monastic orders were established. In the Catholic Church was formed the Knights of the Temple, the Teutonic Knights, the Knights of St. John, all military orders. The real result of the Crusades, though, was a long legacy of bitterness. There was bitterness on the part of Jews who felt attacked when Christians went to attack Islam in Jerusalem. There was bitterness on the part of Eastern Orthodox Christians who felt the Crusaders abused them. And there was bitterness on the part of Islam. Muslims were offended and in some sense to this day recall the Crusades, indicating how cruel Christians proved to be to them. The Crusades then had little intention of converting Muslims even by force. The idea of trying to defeat them and generally trying to kill them did not convert them to Christianity. Now we're going to look at a different approach to the Muslims, exemplified by Francis of Assisi. You may remember him from the previous lesson. Francis not only wandered about Italy, preaching to the animals and helping the poor, and taking care of lepers, he also made a journey to Egypt. He was able to meet the Sultan there, and it is amazing he was able to simply wander in and have an audience with that man. He had many conversations with the Sultan and with other Muslims there. And St. Francis and the Franciscans began a mission movement not only to Muslims, but also to other lands. The greatest of the missionaries in this period was Raymond Lull, a missionary to Islam. Lull decided God was calling him to be a missionary to Muslims. He was going to proclaim to them the gospel in the very home of Islam. He wanted to go somewhere into a Muslim area, probably North Africa. He wanted to preach to them in Arabic. It took him nine years to learn Arabic. He started mission colleges where people could go study languages, apologetics, and learn how to preach in the Muslim setting. One writer has said, without exaggerating, that over the next 500 years, no human voice proclaimed Christ publicly to the Muslims. This time, dominated by the Crusades, was a tragic time in church history. But now the second topic of this lesson is encouraging the Waldensians. 
The Waldensian movement came out of the Catholic Church, it began by, by a man named Waldo. He lived in Lyon, France. He was a wealthy merchant interested to see his emerging class. They were neither aristocracy, elite, nor peasants, but merchants were a new class of people. Waldo became convinced that God was calling him to give away his money and take up preaching. He followed that life, um, a life of poverty. Waldo adopted the lifestyle of poverty in Lyon. Pretty soon people began to gather around him. He not only gave away his money to the poor, he also memorized portions of scripture in the vernacular language of the people. He memorized portions of the writings of the church fathers, such as Augustine. As the Waldensian movement began to grow, they sent someone to Rome to tell the Pope about it and to get papal permission to exist as a movement or an order in the Roman Catholic Church. Now sometimes the Popes gave permission for the formation of new movements. The Franciscans and Dominicans received permission. But many movements were turned down the Pope did not want too many movements in the church. It is very interesting what happened at that interview. A British bishop named Walter Mapp was appointed to question the Waldensian. The interview went something like this. Do you believe in God the Father? And the Waldensian said, we believe. Do believe in God the Son? We believe. He said, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, we believe. And then he asked, do you believe in the Mother of Christ? And the Waldensian said, we believe. Then everyone else in the room began to laugh because the Waldensian had fallen into the trap. The phrase, Mother of Christ, was the phrase Nestorius wanted to use as the solution to the two-nature problem of Christ. And the Roman Catholic Church had denied that phrase which Nestorius used. But here the Waldensian, not knowing this part of church history, simply said, yes, we believe that phrase. And it proved to the Roman Catholic interviewers that he had no competence. And so the Roman Catholic Pope decided not to give approval of the Waldensians as a movement. The Pope told them they could not continue preaching. But Waldo said, it is better to obey God than men. He chose a very good text. Peter said that in Acts. Waldo was later called Peter Waldo. We think because he used this phrase which Peter first said. The Waldensians seemed to go everywhere preaching the gospel it was not long before they were everywhere in Europe. Early in their history, they did not set out to separate from the Roman Catholic Church. They had their children baptized in the Roman Catholic Church. They took communion or mass in the Roman Catholic Church once a year. They called the leaders barbers a word meaning uncle, perhaps because the Roman Catholic Church used father for priests, the Waldensians used uncle for their leaders. They met to study the Bible, 
and to discipline their Christian lives. This was a great influence which prepared the church centuries later for the Protestant Reformation. What were some of the emphases of the Waldensians? For one thing, they emphasized poverty. They gave away their money in order to follow Christ. Peter Waldo says, we have decided to live by the words of the gospel, especially the Sermon on the Mount and its commandments. And so they lived in poverty without concern for tomorrow. The Waldensians felt called to give up their possessions. The Waldensians focused their understanding of what it meant to be Christians on a very strict literal interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount. And that meant repudiating violence in every form. They were totally opposed to the Crusades. Besides poverty, the Waldensians strongly emphasized studying the Bible. They turned directly to the Bible, placed their hands, placed it in the hands of the people by translating it in their language, and they preached it so that people would hear the gospel and be discipled by the scriptures. Sometimes they would sell, as merchants, various things that people might want to buy, precious jewels, books, or cloth. And that helped the Waldensians make a living. It also put them in contact with people to whom they could entrust the scriptures. They were traveling merchants, selling their wares, and distributing scriptures. Another emphasis of the Waldensians consisted of lay preaching. People preached, all of them preached. They believed that every Christian should both know the Bible and have the ability to preach. What did the Waldensians believe about the sacraments? They rejected Roman Catholic sacramental theology. Some sources indicate the Waldensians had only two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. At the time of the Reformation, the Waldensians realized that what was going on in places like Geneva represented much of what they had already accepted and believed for centuries. In 1532, their representatives went to part of the Reformation, including William Farrell. Representatives of the Reformation went to them in the Alps and met leaders there. The Waldensian Church then formally became part of the Protestant Church. And from that time, they separated from Catholicism. As Catholics and Protestants fought, the Waldensians suffered greatly. The situation got so bad that surviving Waldensians finally had to flee their mountains and valleys where they had lived for a long time to escape the notice of Roman Catholicism. They went for a few years to Geneva where the Waldensian church was a church in exile. But in A.D. 1689, they returned to what they called their glorious return, to where they had lived for a while. Like so many of the Protestant churches during the time of the Enlightenment, the Waldensians were influenced by liberal and rational thought. The evangelical revival in Switzerland reached down into the valleys and renewed the old Waldensian church and brought life to it 
later on. Then in the 19th century, many Waldensians migrated to South America and the United States. Most of the Waldensians became Presbyterians. There was a little known town in North Carolina called Valdez. It is the place where a Waldensian church still exists today. The Waldensian church in Italy merged with the Italian Methodist church. That did not help them much because the Methodists did not represent the reformed history and theology of the Waldensian movement. They also brought in much more of an emphasis on social action as the core of the now new Waldensian life in Italy. In some ways, we've simplified greatly Waldensian theology for the sake of one lecture, but we've tried to be accurate in it. You can probably get different expressions of theology from them if you read their books. Some are going to sound more Catholic, some more Protestant. But in general, they come across as Protestants in their view of grace. That, comes to, that brings us to the end of our fourth lecture. <laughs>